Kelly, I think we I think we should probably start. Okay. Okay, I'd like to call the meeting to order. Um, let everybody know we just came from executive session and we are going to go into our regular session. And our first order of business is to um, vote on the minutes from July 22nd and approve the approve those minutes. So can I have a motion to do we have any just can I have a motion to approve the July 22nd meeting minutes. So moved. Second. Anyone. Second. Any discussion. Okay, a vote to accept the July 22nd. Julia. Aye. Matt. Aye. Shannon. Aye. Peter. Aye. Kelly. Aye. Okay, those are accepted. So, sorry, I've got a couple of different platforms going here. Um, we have our, our discussion items are upcoming, but I want, I had a few things that I wanted to mention. Um, the, I heard from the facts group and more than the facts group. And I just wanted to mention, they gave their first scholarship to Grace High, a graduating 2020 graduate, um, and her essay spoke to the heart of the FACTS movement. They received a $4,000 grant from the Attorney General, which is excellent. And they are partnering with Marshfield FACTS for an August 29th overdose awareness event. So you can go to their website to find more information on that. Um, next, I wanted to mention the Duxbury Interfaith Council and the Rotary Club combined are putting on a racism awareness event on August 5th which is what, next Wednesday at 5 p.m. on Train Field. And their information is at www.prejudicefreeduxbury.com. Um, and then I contacted Dave, you know, with all the return to school information, I contacted Dave Mamoron and had a conversation with him around Dragon's Lair because I felt that was sort of a good litmus test for groups congregating over the summer. Um, and he has had roughly 400 kids in grades four through 12 in the program all summer. They socially distanced, they had hand sanitizer at every single location. Um, they had the kids wipe down equipment if they did a rotation indoors and the kids were responsible and all did that. And they have zero cases reported of COVID from staff or students who participated. It was a five week program. So I just thought that might be some valid information to bring to the table. And my last point is um, sort of to the general public. I just want to caution folks when they write letters to us um, that their tone matters and to please refrain from insulting staff members and administrators who are working around the clock tirelessly in efforts to return our kids and our staff members safely to school. Um, I will not acknowledge a letter that insults a staff member or an administrator. Um, and tonight we are going to have presentations about back to school plans and there still will be some questions. So I would ask the school that they access the building principal as a resource before coming to us, if that person can answer your questions. So that's all. All right, John, go ahead. Uh, Kelly, thank you for saying that. I, I really appreciate it. Um, so I'm actually just gonna uh, kick, kick this off and then really quickly turn over the principals. The principals really are gonna present the meat um, of, uh, of the meeting here tonight, and it's uh, it's a pretty extensive presentation. But I just really, for a quick for update purposes and just some contextual purposes, I want to share I want to share four or five slides if that's okay. So I'm going to share my screen. Okay. Um, so.
so I didn't know how to title this. It's really just like, it, it, it's, it's what it is. It's some miscellaneous updates that a lot of them aren't, aren't related to each other, but they're things that I think the committee needs to be aware of um, in some updates since, since our meeting last week. And so let me just, let me kind of run through these. Um, the first is that you, know, you may have seen in the news, uh, certainly the committee knows about it, but the um, Commissioner of Education announced um, that he had an agreement with the State uh, Teachers Association that for the 2020, uh, 2021 school year, they were reducing the 180 day school day requirement to 170 days. The idea is that we'd add 10 training days essentially um, to the be beginning of the school year. Um, with that being said, school would need to start by September 16th. So as of right now, um, we, our, our students were set to come back. We actually already revised our calendar once. Our students were set to come back on the Tuesday um, after Labor Day. Um, I, we don't have a firm plan yet for what that week's gonna look like. But what I can say is I don't believe that that will be a full return to school week for students. Uh, chances are it could be part orientation, part teacher training. Um, but no matter what our model is, I don't expect to get fully back to business, if you will, for students until likely September 14th, if not a day or two later. So that is, uh, for lack of a better description, that is the expectation from the Department of Education. And I expect every district in the Commonwealth um, to be doing a similar thing. So that's news uh, and stay tuned for kind of a further revision to the calendar. The school committee will have to vote that um, at a future date. Also this week, um, the state released guidance on transportation, which I have to say really uh, impacts um, a, lot of, a lot of our planning. Um, the guidance is not surprising, um, but what it is is that students uh, should be seated no more than one student per bench, right? So what that means, and you can see this um, diagram on the bottom, what that means is our 77 person, uh, 77 uh, student capacity buses shrink to about 26 or 27 students. You can see here how, how they recommend students be, be seated. So as I say here, that has significant implications if we were considering a full in-person return to school. We really wouldn't have enough buses um, to accommodate a full, uh, our full student population. Not to say we couldn't, but what it would mean is things like double bus runs, which would mean staggered start times for students, which would mean um, an impact to our student learning time. But I just want you to know, uh, this has to be a factor, a major factor in our back to school planning efforts, it just does. Um, and again, we're not, obviously not alone, um, but I want you to know that that guidance uh, was, was released last Friday, Friday evening. So with that, again, unrelated, a lot of miscellaneous things. There's been a lot of questions about Magic Dragon uh, and Extended Day. And I'm not surprised by that. People are very anxious to get their um, daycare and, and extended day uh, plans in order. We don't have the answers at this point. Uh, there's simply too many moving parts uh, as of today. But the expectation as of today is that both Magic Dragon and extended day will open if we return fully in person or hybrid. If we return to school full of remote, these programs will not be running. Um, even with that, there's gonna be significant amount of modifications to those programs. I put an example here that if we ran a hybrid model, um, you know, only students who, you know, um, students who, students would only attend extended day on the days that they're in person, right? So if they're in an AB model, if they're home, we would not have the capacity or the ability to accommodate them, you know, at extended day. So again, stay tuned, but I do want folks to know that we do plan as of today um, to reopen both of those programs. 
and I just have to ask for people's patience. We just simply don't have, uh, don't have enough uh, information to um, put a full plan in place at this point. Other kind of random questions fall sports. Um, we, I was told today uh, on, a, on a statewide call that guidance on fall sports is still likely two weeks away, up to two weeks away. So we, we don't have any answers as to whether or not we'll have fall sports at this point. Um, I do like some of uh, what I'm hearing. Um, I think there's some level of optimism that some uh, sports, uh, probably not all sports could return with significant modifications, um, but that could, that could also, um, the possibility still exists that we won't have any sports. So again, guidance is likely two weeks away. This is kind of a big one. Um, as you all know, the Department of Ed uh, in the state is requiring masks for all students in grades two and above. We are gonna make a recommendation. I am making a recommendation to the committee as part of our planning um, that we extend that requirement to all students in grades pre-K to 12. Um, that's at least a consensus recommendation out of, out of our leadership team. Um, we have some great, um, we have a great test case uh, in our extended school year program. We have uh, very, very young students at the pre-K and, and uh, at the pre-K level wearing masks with, and with, with, no, with no incidents. Um, so we would strongly recommend that we just make that a blanket, blanket requirement. Obviously that's, that's gonna be a, a committee decision, um, but we think we can make it work and we think it's the right thing to do. As it relates to social distancing, you know, as you consider our plans tonight that the principals will lay out, even though a minimum of um, physical distance guideline of three feet um, has been established, we, we, you know, when combined with all these safety measures, um, we are still aiming for six feet when possible. And I, you know, I, I just think that's a more ideal situation. Um, it's not going to be an, an absolute, but you know, as we as we consider our plans, we do like to do, do like to consider how we can make this happen at six feet, simply because that's kind of become the norm, you know, in our in our in our communities. So just again, kind of food for thought more than anything. Uh, whoops, uh, just a couple of things, sort of FYI as it relates to facilities. Um, we. Uh, Partly because of state requirements, partly because of social distancing guidelines um, and some recent guidelines uh, about extracurricular, uh, not extracurricular, um, specialist classes like music and chorus, a band and chorus and that type of thing. We are doing a significant amount of planning uh, to develop outdoor learning spaces. Um, sounds much fancier than it is. I'm talking about tents um, at strategic locations around the district. Um, it'll have a significant cost. Uh, but it's going to be critical. You know, the guidance is, and our expectation is that we need to have kids outdoors as much as possible. Um, it's just kind of a reality of the situation, but we need to, to protect them from the elements the best we can. So we're planning for, we're planning for tents, um, you know, all, all around, all around the district. We continue to further develop our cleaning and disinfecting protocols. Um, and, you know, we'll lay that out when the plans are finalized, just with the frequency of, um, you know, cleaning and disinfecting on both high touch areas and classrooms. So we continue to develop that plan uh, with Brian and, and Katie. We, we do have a lot of questions. Um, you know, we have very modern systems at the middle school and high school. Um, Chandler and Alder are older buildings, um, but we are going to be conducting a professional analysis of our HVAC, HVAC system, particularly at Alden School. We have, because it's a three-story building, Chandler is much easier to deal with because it's one, it's a one-story building. Um, Chandler is tricky because it has three stories and that top level in particular, you know, gets hot and feels, it feels like it doesn't have as much airflow. Um, that being said, it does have airflow because we have a pretty sophisticated HVAC system there. But we feel it's important to get a professional analysis of that system and we'll be conducting that um, soon. So we have a third party kind of professional look at, looking at that. Um, we're also going to have a biologist come in and conduct some baseline um, air sampling uh, in, in the next week or so uh, to see kind of what it looks like today. Um, so we have that baseline and that, and, you know, chances are we'll be conducting air quality testing 
perhaps weekly. Um, haven't made the final decision on that. Uh, but I, you know, once the school year begins, I think air quality obviously uh, is a subject of um, great interest, you know, for, for folks, including including us. So we uh, we're taking that very seriously. And finally, and I just put a picture here of one of our Duxbury branded hand sanitizing stations. <laughs> but um, the requirements for hand sanitation and hand washing. Um, uh, it's when you're walking to school, when you, when you come into school, when you leave school, when you put on your mask, when you take off your mask, before you eat, after you eat. Um, we need to have hand sanitizing and hand washing readily available. So um, when we get back to school, sorry, my mouse is very sensitive. When we get back to school, there will be a sea of hand sanitizing stations available. And this is, we got this model in today. It's actually a foot pedal. Um, uh, station. So again, those are some very kind of random uh, disparate updates for you, but I just did want to provide some level of context um, about about some of our planning. These are the things we're working on. Um, and that's all I'll say about that. If there's, are there any questions about what I just said? I know it, they're very random, but it was intended to be so. And then I'll turn over to the principals. Now, John, I just would, I'm one who loves um, hand washing over all this hand sanitizer. I know obviously we need both, but the more kids could actually use soap and water during the day, the better. That is our goal too. Yep, that is our goal. We agree. All right, that's it for me. I'm actually going to turn it over to our principals. Um, let me stop sharing. for a moment and then um, one of the principals will share. Um, our leadership team has been working, um, you know, around the clock on this. And I, I think you'll find the plans that the principals present tonight to be very thoughtful and, and um, detailed and hopefully it's gonna go a long way towards answering uh, questions that I know a lot of residents um, have. And so that's all I'll say about that. And so who is, I'll turn it over to you. Principals, thank you very much for attending. I really appreciate it. John, would you let me share my screen? Yes. Um, sorry. I'm the holder of the presentation slides. <laughs> OK, I think you should be good, Sarah. Okay, so I'm going to start with the Chandler plans. Um, as you know, we've been going through and um, developing three different plans for return to school. We um, have developed an in-person plan, a hybrid plan, and a remote learning plan for each of the buildings. So I'm going to start and then each of the other principals are going to go through their three plans. So starting with the Chandler in-person return plan, um, basically in order for all students to come back to the building for a full return, we'll need to make many modifications to all major parts of the school day. Um, I'm gonna give an overview of what those changes are and there are many details that are not represented in these slides, but feel free to ask questions about anything as I'm going along. Um, so arrival first will need to be modified. So arrival for K-2, to as you know, we have two entrances at Chandler. Integrated preschool enters through the Canty Wing and the K-2 through students enter through the main entrance. Arrival for K-2, through normally, for anyone who's seen our arrival process, we drop off um, 10 busloads full of students at the same time. And they're all walking down the sidewalk together and in the building together. For this plan, we would have only two buses dropping off at a time right at the front door of the school. And then those buses would drive away um, and the next two buses would come. Parent drop off at this entrance would remain the same as it is now, although um, we definitely realize that the drop off line will be increasing. Um, 
And then as students are walking into the building, teachers will be in the hallway to monitor their social distancing as they're walking down to their classrooms and making sure that they have masks on. Um, for the integrated preschool arrival at the Canty entrance, we will also have a drop off line that's like a rolling car line, much like we have for K through two. Staff would accept students out of the car and walk them to their teacher. Um, we do have many preschool students who are still in car seats. So if the child is in a car seat, we'd ask parents to get out of the car, unbuckle their child and um, sort of hand them over to our staff member. Um, and, you know, we do realize this drop off routine will have an impact on the Magic Dragon drop off times. So we'll likely need to limit um, Magic Dragon drop off to um, not overlap with the integrated preschool drop off. So during the school day, we would be following all the state safety guidelines that have been put into place. All students, as Dr. Antonucci mentioned, regardless of grade level, will wear masks during the school day. Um, students will wash hands upon arrival into their classroom. We do have sinks in all of our classrooms, which is great. Students will be assigned a spot once they're in their classroom. So for grades one and two, they'll have an assigned desk. Um, in preschool and kindergarten, we would have an assigned spot for the day. So one day a student might be assigned to be sitting at a table. The next day, the student might be assigned a spot on the um, floor with um, floor dots and things like that. We're still um, sort of developing um, how we, you know, how we would manage the preschool and kindergarten spacing and making sure that at the end of each day, everything's sanitized so that we could assign new spots for the following day. Um, we'll not be sharing materials. So each student will be giving their own set of materials. All shared um, sort of furniture will be removed from classrooms. So Lego tables, sand tables, um, and anything like that where students are, you know, sort of hands on the um, materials. We will also be designating outdoor space that can be used for classroom use um, and also for mask breaks throughout the day because we realize that's going to be really important for all students. Um, we are fortunate that our many of our classrooms have designated bathrooms. However, we do have some classrooms that share bathrooms that are in the hallway. So we're developing a procedure for bathroom use that would essentially be one student in, one student out for those bathrooms, um, which will definitely take some training on the part of the Chandler kids, but I think we can do it. Um, Sarah, if you can go to the next slide. So lunch and recess will also need to be modified. Lunch will be served in classrooms. Um, cafeteria staff, based on orders in the morning, will prepare the lunches and deliver them to the classrooms. Um, we are still developing a plan for how to manage unmasked students eating with the six feet distance that they'll have to be um, spread apart in the classrooms because, you know, at our level, we need a lot of supervision during lunch. So this is a challenge right now that we're still working on, um, but it's definitely something that we're trying to plan for. As you know, we have two recesses at Chandler. We will still be able to have those recesses, but they'll need to be scheduled separate from our lunch blocks. Um, because as I said, we need to really maximize our supervision during the lunch periods. And um, especially if students are gonna be spread out around the building and not in one central location in the cafeteria. So for recess, students would use one door to exit the building and to go onto the playground and a different door to come back into the building. Playgrounds would be um, sort of portioned off so that one class would be assigned to one spot on the playground per day. Um, and then we'd have a chance, to, we'd have space uh, time built in, in between recesses so that any commonly touched surfaces could be sanitized in between recesses for each class use. Special areas in a full in-person model um, we would be able to maintain our specialist schedule, but specialists would come to classrooms rather than um, using, you know, their space, like we wouldn't use the art room or the music room or the gym. Um, and 
all classes would be held outside when possible, but especially PE for the majority of the year in this model. Uh, and no books would be able to be taken home from the library. Dismissal will also have to be modified um, because we will not have parents entering the building in um, an in-person return. We'll need to alter the way we do parent pickup at the end of the day. So for both integrated preschool and the K through two dismissal, we will accomplish this by having a car line. Um, we'll provide all families with a sign that has their last name and their grade and their child's name. Um, students will be waiting inside and then would be escorted out to their um, parents when their parents get there to pick them up. And then we would also modify the number of buses dismissed at once to avoid crowding in the hallway, much like I talked about at arrival. Um, so moving on to the hybrid plan. So the second option, our second plan is our hybrid plan. This would, this means that essentially we are limiting the capacity of each classroom to approximately 50%. And it's important to note that all the arrival and dismissal and safety precautions, lunch and recess and all of that that I just talked about in the in-person plan still stay in place for the hybrid plan. So each class at Chandler, uh, preschool through two, would be broken up into two cohorts, A and B. As principals, we've been working to create cohorts across the district. We've been working to make sure that siblings in all four schools are in the same cohort. And although it would have been easier, definitely, to split each class by alphabet, we really felt at the elementary level that it was important to maintain all the hard work that was done in the spring by teachers to um, try to preserve those groupings as best we could. So a student moving on from one classroom last year would, um, we tried to prioritize them moving on with a familiar face for next school year in their cohort. Um, this wasn't always possible for sure, but we tried as best as we could to accomplish this when it was possible. And um, given all the factors and parameters we're working around to create these cohorts, you can imagine how complicated this process has been district-wide with over 3,000 students. So we would just really ask families to understand that it would be very difficult at this point to accommodate any special requests for cohorts. Um, and those will be sent out as soon as um, we decide on our plan. So in the hybrid plan for Chandler, students would come either Monday, Thursday or Tuesday, Friday. Um, every day, regardless of whether they are at home or at school, students will participate in a morning meeting and an afternoon wrap up meeting. This is really important for creating and maintaining the classroom community for our students. So in a normal elementary school experience during the day, there are periods of instruction that happen with their teacher and then periods of independent practice that students are working on their own. In our hybrid model, the in-person learning day, um, we're going to, the teacher is gonna maximize that time together by prioritizing the explicit instruction for students while they're in the building in front of the teacher. Teachers would also use this time to explain and prepare students for their remote learning day, which will be the following day for them. Students would be given all materials necessary for their assignments for the following day. The next day when students are home, um, they, will they will complete their independent practice work. They will also have access to lessons on video given by teachers um, as, a, as it's appropriate for what they're learning. In this model, special area teachers will meet with students in a mixture of remote and in-person, making sure that both cohorts are able to meet in person with specialist teachers on a rotating basis. And we are still working out the details of that as well. Special education services will also be able to continue um, to be provided on remote days for students on IEPs. So in the next part of our hybrid plan, we recognize, if you could just go on to the next slide, we do recognize that there are some students who may elect to remain home and not participate in the above 
outline plans for health reasons or extenuating circumstances. And for these students, we've created a cohort C plan as part of our hybrid or in-person model. At the elementary level, students in cohort C would still be placed in a classroom as they normally would be. The classroom teacher would provide all assignments which will align with the rest of the grade level. And then another Chandler teacher, not their classroom teacher, would be designated to manage the um, online learning of the cohort C students. So that teacher would provide all the small group instruction and support the student learning in collaboration with the classroom teacher. Um, for, this, for this cohort or for this option, we, there are definitely challenge the challenges that we see. Um, you know, students in cohort C would be grouped with other students who are not necessarily in their class. And essentially these students would have two teachers. So this could be a challenge for our youngest students, which um, we recognize. And if we were in a position to transition, transition into a full remote environment, cohort C students would rejoin the rest of their class and for the duration of the remote experience. So moving on to our full remote plan. So um, this plan, this is separate. This is the full remote plan if all students are learning at home in a remote setting. This would also be a four day model with an independent learning day on Wednesday of each week. Teachers would provide each family with a weekly learning grid on Fridays of each week. This would include um, links to pre recorded lessons, Zoom links for live lessons, and printable options for work. Um, I should mention too that grade level grade levels will be collaborating on these plans that will be sent home. So um, the grid for each grade level will be the same. They will, um, each day of remote learning, students will again log into a morning meeting and an afternoon meeting. And then they'll have a regular schedule of small group instruction for math and literacy each week. And students will be, will also have a regularly scheduled um, specialist area for um, each of the five specials. Um, oh, sorry, I forgot to mention students would also be instructed in each subject area in this plan with assignments to turn in on our um, online, using our online learning platforms and teachers will provide feedback to students on assignments. One of the major parts of this model that I'd like everyone to really understand is that we recognize at the early childhood level that learning on a computer screen is not what's best for our kids. So as long as it's safe to do so, we would like to have student material pick up on Fridays of each week. So during teacher planning days on Wednesday, teachers would essentially prepare any materials that students would need for the following week of instruction. Um, you know, it could include construction paper or, um, you know, hands-on manipulatives that they're going to be using or lesson specific pages. Um, and then we, we will organize a parent drive through to pick up these materials on Friday of each week. In addition, I think it's really important to remember that if we're in a remote environment at some point during the year, we are going to arrange that all students will have everything they need at home including all the workbooks that they have in their desk normally um, that they can work on, the math manipulatives that they have in their desks um, at school, the foundations materials and writing journals and all of those things that students access during the day at school um, while they're with us, they would also have at home, um, which makes this different, this, this remote learning environment much different from what we had to experience in the spring. Um, but because of this, we are able to tailor many of our assignments around what we know students have access to at home and therefore we'll be able to limit screen time, which is a, a big priority for us. So if we are in this situation, we'll also ensure that um, parent training is a major component of this because um, we do recognize that there are a lot of learning platforms to learn and um, all of the challenges that come along with parents at our level. And then before I pass it along to Mr. E and the Alden plans, I just wanted to make sure everyone realizes that 
we all take this responsibility very seriously to come up with plans that are developmentally appropriate for our students and whichever model we end up with i'm really confident that the chandler staff will work to make sure that students are supported at their level and are learning every day thanks Aaron. that was excellent I'm happy to answer questions or we can wait until the end too. Does anybody have questions? No, I'm all set, thanks. So, um, you know, Aaron, I would just like to say, um, you know, given the high degree of uncertainty and also how rapidly things are changing, um, I, you know, I really appreciate how thoughtful and how clear and concise um, I'm sure there'll still be uh, further refinement and certainly some of the areas that you identified, but I think it's very comprehensive and complete. Um, and uh, so thank you, appreciate it. Thank you. I, I have one question. Um, you mentioned parent training for the remote learning. I assume there would also be parent training if there was a hybrid plan as well, because that would also include some um, need to log into these various online platforms. Absolutely. And I think that, you know, just sort of assuming that in a hybrid model, we have more access to um, people because we have, will have the ability to interface with students a little bit more. So we would be able to do those in a different way. But, but certainly it's part of both plans. Okay, thank you. All right, Alden School. Hi, everybody. How's everybody today? Good I, uh, Hi, uh, my, my presentation looks a little bit different than Aaron's. I, I do want to assure everybody that um, the elementary admin teams were uh, really super in sync on this. Mine looks a little different because I, uh, I don't want to repeat everything Aaron said, and a lot of it is very, very similar. Um, so you can almost look at this as like a Cliff Notes version that will sort of review a lot of the main points. Uh, and I'll be sure to try to point out the, where there are differences. Um, so our in-person return, again, affects, uh, I have sort of three main areas outlined. Our arrival um, starts at 7.30 and is con that's condensed a little from the way it is now. Parents can sometimes drop off a little bit early, but we'd have like a, a, a hard sort of a, a drop off at 7.30. Um, Parent drop off would remain unchanged, but the buses would have to let out two at a time and we'd have to manage how many students are on the uh, sidewalks outside coming in. Um, our buses don't, as it is now, drop off all at once. They sort of do trickle in. Um, so that won't be too different from us, but uh, from the way it always has been, but we'll have to make sure only a couple of buses are, are letting off at a time. Um, and we'll have social distancing floor decals and markers indicating for students to see how far apart they should leave for space when coming into the building. Um, classroom safety precautions, um, just like Aaron talked about, it's all the same for Alden desk placement, elimination of extra furniture to spread uh, desks out as far as they uh, can go to ensure a three to six foot distance from students, uh, carpeting eliminated, assigned desks, um, lots of use of outdoor spaces, uh, including some tents and some, some areas to uh, expand uh, classroom learning environments, uh, masks, hand washing, um, so all of those same classroom safety procedures that, uh, that Aaron talked about with the um, with the Chandler plan. Um, lunch and recess, at, just like at, at Chandler, served in classrooms. We'll have to section off um, playgrounds and fields uh, assigned by uh, different cohorts of classrooms. Uh, hand, uh, hand sanitization upon re-entry of the building will be really important. Uh, managing the exits and the entries, uh, having some lag time, which we've always had between recesses. Um, to be able to safely get students in and out without running into each other in hallways and so forth. Um, so all of that's in place. Uh, next slide continues the in-person uh, return. Um, 
lunch and recess is served in classrooms. I think I touched on that. The playground field sectioned off. Uh, specialists are held outside uh, when possible. Uh, our other specialists will travel to classrooms to limit student movement uh, and exposure to other students in the hallways and keep the hallways clear. Um, no books taken home. Um, and like I said, we're making plans for additional outside spaces, including uh, some covered areas, which will help us at um, dismissal as well. We go down to, to dismissal. We are gonna have to increase our dismissal duration. Right now, Alden School being the first school, we dismiss in 10 minutes, which um, in a regular scenario is sort of a very fast paced, uh, hectic at times dismissal. Uh, we have to not have a hectic dismissal at all um, with these safety precautions. So we have to kind of cut out and start dismissing a little bit earlier uh, to spread it out. Um, right now, as far as parent pickup, parents come into the building. So parents won't come into the building to pick up. Uh, instead, we'll stage that uh, in, for lack of a better word, the courtyard or that grass off, grassy area behind our school library in the back uh, opposite the Alden Street side on the back of the building. Um, and likewise, we can have parents will have signs and, and will line up by floor. So that is a difference from Chandler. Chandler is planning a, um, like a car dismissal or right to cars. Um, we do still need to kind of keep our dismissal pretty fast paced to get those buses to the next routes. Um, so we think that will be safe, but also kind of keep it moving along at a little quicker pace. Um, so an exterior dismissal, not unlike for the for people who are on the call now, not unlike we've staged in the cafeteria for the last several years, uh, and in the lobby, but outside uh, with a little bit with a lot more space. Um, and we we're talking about this anyway, but I'd like to digitize the student note procedures. Um, for a couple of reasons to prevent students from delivering, having to deliver those notes every day to the office, um, but also then we're not taking the paper from home and that's being passed through three different hands uh, on the way down to our office. Um, so that's something we've been looking at doing. All right, next slide um, is our hybrid plan. Uh, and it's important to note too, and uh, Ms. Wiesan said the same thing, uh, all, the, all the safety precautions that exist in the in-person plan exist in this hybrid plan also, but they're not rewritten here. Um, so all those things I went over with arrival and dismissal, safety precautions in the classrooms, those all exist in this hybrid plan. Um, so like you heard at Chandler School, um, starting the school day and ending the school day with a daily morning meeting for all students in both co cohorts A and B. Um, and uh, so the students are on Zoom uh, from home, depending on the day. Um, those the students are divided into cohorts A and B, about fifty percent in each, and they have a Monday, um, you know, Monday, Thursday, Tuesday, Friday schedule with a Wednesday for an independent learning day and teacher planning. Um, so this is all very similar um, to what you heard about Chandler School. Um, just with different times for dismissal and arrival and so forth. Um, to continue the hybrid plan, again, not, nothing totally different than what you heard at Chandler School. Um, remote learning students are working on assignments um, that they were instructed on and were given during in-person learning. Um, students are working independently and supported. Um, Perhaps they're interacting with some of their specialists and uh, special education teachers or speech and language pathologists. Um, and uh, in-person learning, they're in school for the full regular day. So that's 7.45 to two. They have a regular schedule, including specialists, although that's, we're still kind of working out how might that, the specifics of how that might work. Lunch in classrooms um, and really, uh, teachers are really maximizing that instructional time, knowing that the next day, uh, those students have to be set up and prepared to learn remotely um, successfully. And then you like, like you heard uh, with Chandler School with its C cohort, uh, we recognize that there are going to be students and families totally uncomfortable with having students attend school in the fall, uh, regardless of the plan we put in place. Um, so that C cohort would enable students to, to learn remotely um, with a teacher sort of dedicated to that cohort, um, but also remain a part of their regular classroom assignments, um, 
by connecting them in, with in on Zoom for morning and afternoon meetings. Um, but their classwork and um, small group uh, instruction and learning is managed by another Alden teacher. Um, so that's yeah, that's the uh, that's the C cohort plan. So um, starting the school day again, like I said, more they have morning meetings. They participate on Zoom, just like when the if A is in, B and C are now zooming in for those morning meetings and at the end of the school day. Um, and then during the school day, they're working with that remote teacher with small group instruction. Um, and like Ms. Wiesahan said, that will involve students from different classes. Um, so that you know, it, it's certainly a drawback to have. I could, to have you know di different teachers and managing that and, and kind of feeling like a member of, of both groups um, when you're spreading yourself out a little bit for the students. And um, the ro remote plan, again, same, same um, safety uh, precautions that we talked about. Um, students are working from home on assignments provided by a teacher. Um, the, I think the key difference from the spring is there are regularly scheduled Zoom meetings. We're talking about two per week per student of small group literacy and small group math, uh, regularly scheduled live sessions with specialist teachers. Um, assignments are tied to instruction and teacher feedback. It's, none of this is different than what you heard from uh, Ed Chandler. This was planned uh, together. Um, and like Ms. Wiesahan was saying, parent training is very important as a part of this plan or a hybrid plan where parents are managing some of their um, their students work online. Um, one difference in this remote plan, in our remote plan, we're not looking to do a, a weekly um, materials pickup. Um, we feel like at, at Alden School, we're providing most of the hands-on materials like workbooks, agendas, um, math manipulatives, uh, all those things will be provided with to students and I just it's just not necessary to have new materials being provided each week for our third and fifth graders. And the rest of the remote plan um, is starting again just it's starting the school day and ending the school day um, with those zoom meetings so that uh, everyone's feeling a part of um, of those classroom cohorts and trying to maintain a sense of community and classroom when everyone is spread out in their own, uh, in, you know, in their own, own homes at their own addresses. Um, so again, that's mine is a little bit more of an overview and review um, of what uh, we were talking about at Chandler School. And again, if there are new questions that came up uh, or questions about the differences in this plan uh, versus the Chandler plan, although there are few, very few, uh, I could certainly take them. Aaron and Chase, I think I'm a little bit confused. Um, sorry, my internet is not great here. I think I'm a little confused on the days that kids aren't in school. You know, you've got a second or third grader, and so it's their day to be remote, and they attend morning meeting and afternoon meeting, and then they're accessing another how do they access the teacher for help if they need help during the day that's the piece i'm not understanding yeah so i think that we um you know we are going to have videos and things like that available for kids for new lessons and also you know making sure that the kids are set up to do independent learning um and you know we definitely have the option to put in some office hour time for teachers you know and that's part of the plan that we're sort of still developing based on what model we end up with so we've definitely talked about that concern and it's something that we've thought about too but it's just we don't necessarily have it fully developed yet on how that will look but we we recognize that we will need to allow students to ask their teacher questions during the day when they're home sure all right thanks Anybody else? All right, are we on to middle school? Oh, good evening, everybody. So, uh, Sarah and I are going to uh, 
tackle some beginning parts of this together. Um, Jim, I'm going to stop you. I'm sorry, I couldn't find my unmute button, but you um, you have the scary voice on with your headphones. I don't know if that was just me. No, no I, I heard it too. Okay. <laughs> nope, that was everyone. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, uh, so, like Jim was saying, if you could make it out, <laughs> um, he and I are going to talk through um, the middle and high school plans very similarly to um, Aaron and Chase, we worked really closely together to have plans that align. And so the first few slides here um, will take you through some of the um, safety precautions and things like that that are alike in the buildings. Um, and then we'll kind of break into our um, building specific um, plans and touch on the, the differences there. Um, so uh, the first um, item on, on our planning for next year uh, is a schedule change. Um, so this group certainly knows that um, Jim and I have worked really closely with a collaborative team of teachers and um, um, the DTA to build a schedule that was meant to roll out this fall. Um, but given the scenarios we're facing right now, we've decided to retain some portions of that work um, while rolling in some significant adjustments. Um, so the schedule on the right of the screen right now will be the schedule we would use in uh, any potential environment we have this year, whether full return, in-person, remote, or hybrid. Um, so what you can see is that we have a total of eight blocks in the schedule, each of about 40 minutes of class time. In the middle of the day, you'll notice we have our um, sort of to be named directed study hall, um, which was a big part of our schedule that was meant to occur this fall. Um, this will serve um, in both buildings is a lunch home base um, while periods one through four would occur in the morning and five through seven in the afternoon. Um, a few things influence the schedule change. Um, a major one that, uh, that influenced that was given the potential for some portion of the year to be in a, a remote or hybrid environment. Um, we really felt increasing the frequency of class meetings to every single school day was very important. Um, it also means we're increasing um, access for students to that study hall period um, for support and it creates consistent and predictable travel routes for groups of kids uh, between periods um, and during lunch, which essentially for us reduces some of the variables for us to manage um, in the building. Um, and you'll also notice that in this schedule we have two lunch periods. Um, we'll talk a little bit more on that in a later slide. So across both buildings, we'll be equipping classrooms with hand sanitizers um, that students would use upon entry and exit. Um, and students and staff will wipe down uh, desks between cohorts of students um, as some of our safety precautions in classrooms. Um, students will be seated at least three feet um, from each other facing forward in the classrooms. Um, and we have in our uh, classrooms and around the building, all students and teachers wearing masks um, with periodic mass breaks built into the day. Um, just like Chandler and Alden, we do plan to use outdoor spaces as much as possible um, and are exploring some, uh, some tents and things like that around our campus that can help us do that in a variety of weather. Um, in our hallways, um, we have a number of safety precautions that uh, will run throughout both the middle and the high school, um, including signage and decals on the floors and walls to indicate travel directions in particular hallways. And overall, uh, we're working to reduce um, at the middle school, especially the, the hallway traffic by, um, well, both buildings, by eliminating the use of lockers for this year. Um, so we have fewer students in those spaces for any extended period of time where, um, you know, kids can tend to get pretty close together when they're using their lockers. Um, we are working to reduce hallway travel as well. So for instance, um, for the gyms, students will use the main street ent entrances as opposed to um, traveling down side hallways to get to locker rooms. And we won't be using locker rooms um, for PE classes this year. Our restrooms um, have a number of safety precautions we've added. So they'll be cleaned um, 
multiple times a day, increased cleaning there, and we are um, working to install paper towel dispensers in every restroom. Um, when we built the building, we have um, hand dryers that were super um, environmentally conscious, but um, we do think uh, paper towel dispensers would be better for students washing their hands. Um, the restrooms will operate a single capacity for this year, so one student in, one student out, and we'll have um, signage and decals to ensure students who are waiting to use the bathroom can be spaced appropriately. Um, and uh, so for lunch, um, in order to address uh, guidance indicating a six foot distance between people um, being needed while eating lunch, we plan to use classrooms, hallways, team areas, gymnasiums, outdoor spaces, um, in addition to the cafeteria to adequately space our students. Um, we uh, have also been able to um, acquire some uh, plexiglass partitions that can support separating students safely um, during lunch as well. Um, and I, I have to express my gratitude for the food service providers, Chartwells. Um, they've had some really um, creative solutions to ensure that we can get students lunch um, in these variety of spaces and efficiently do that. Um, so for instance, at DMS, um, our cafeteria workers will be bringing lunches to the team areas for students to grab and go to their lunch location, which will be designated to them. Um, while uh, high school students can, can use them both scrambles and spread out in the in the cafeteria. And I'm going to transition here um, into some middle school specific slides. Um, so uh, for the middle school in person plan, our full return plan. Um, we anticipate students arrival starting at 750 um, and that uh, we may, as uh, Dr. Antonucci alluded to, need a, um, some adjustment to start times depending on um, transportation um, with buses. Um, but bus drop off would continue to be in front of the high school. Um, students may have specific doorways to sort of spread out crowds, although um, typically our buses at the middle and high school um, sort of self stagger um, based on how the routes conclude, um, which is helpful to us in this in the circumstance. Um, and then for parent drop off, we'll continue to use the DMS side of the building, but um, we will uh, uh, extend that drop off zone, the length of the side of DMS there again, um, in the uh, uh, hopes of sort of reducing clumps of kids coming in at one time and, and managing entry into the building. At the middle school, students um, typically, in a typical year, would um, go to the library or to the cafeteria to wait for the start of uh, their first period um, when they can go into their team areas and unload. This year, we, we can't um, have students crowded like that. And so, um, our students will report directly to their first block classrooms um, at, uh, when they arrive. Um, teachers will take attendance. Um, that may be a time where we submit lunch orders um, to our cafeteria. Um, and uh, our teachers will be there to uh, monitor those student groups as they arrive um, and ensure that students aren't congregating in areas um, and are abiding by um, safety protocols. Um, and again, just uh, uh, to reiterate, we won't have students using lockers, so they'll go directly to classrooms, um, reducing traffic in the hallways. Sarah, can I just jump in really quick? We've had a quest couple questions about, um, since students won't be accessing lockers, will they be allowed to carry their backpacks with shared, um, so that we can have students not sharing materials or not being able to access their books during the day? Could you speak to that very briefly? Yes, so that, that is a plan. Um, that's not typically what we do um, at the middle school, um, but uh, a couple of things there. We will allow students at the middle school to carry their backpacks with them so they can have their materials. Um, we also have um, posted on the middle school website supply lists by grade. And what you will notice um, is our teachers have kind of considered the um, individual supply uh, 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 materials uh, that we would love students to have in their backpack and ready, um, readily available for their classes. Um, we work to really revise those lists to be thoughtful about that um, for this year as well. Those are not team based either, they're great. 
grade level based. Um, so we've had to make some special considerations for our elective courses in some cases at the middle school. Um, so for instance, uh, Desi just recently sent out guidance around music, PE and art classes that dictates in some cases um, increased spacing needs. Um, you know, for instance, the guidance around chorus and band um, increases spacing to about 10 feet, I believe, um, and says that th that should only occur outside. Um, so we are planning to use alternative spaces to hopefully allow our students opportunities to sing and play as much as possible this year. Um, additionally, our PE guidance indicated uh, restrictions on some equipment use and cleaning protocols, um, increased spacing between students. And so again, um, as much as possible, outdoor spaces um, really help us uh, with that. Um, and we do, uh, uh, we are reviewing some of the health curriculum and, and adding some wellness units um, to be postured in the event that we, we couldn't use an outdoor space on a particular day, that we could have those classes occur in um, classrooms. Um, and continue the learning that way. Um, at the middle school, we, we do have uh, typically um, electives that uh, span across teams and sometimes across grade levels. Uh, we have made significant efforts this year uh, to eliminate that wherever possible and, and attempt to cohort our students um, and really uh, reduce the number of students across the entire building that they interact with um, and, and uh, just to control the exposure to different student groups. Um, so what that looks like is um, our, uh, many of our electives uh, like art, tech ed, STEM, um, PE and music um, will be on team to the extent possible and uh, at, at least at grade level. Um, Lastly, uh, we are anticipating um, library use being controlled significantly. Um, we want to be mindful of, of uh, uh, likewise, we're not going to have books going home. Um, you know, our librarians do a number of instructional uh, exercises with kids. Those could um, be happening in classrooms and push in that way. Um, and lastly, we foresee guidance, our guidance department um, running quite differently this year um, by appointment only. Um, and, and managing uh, where students are traveling and when, um, and having uh, parent and family conferences uh, using a video conferencing um, tool like Zoom or, or something like that as we anticipate, um, like Chandler and Alden, not having um, families be coming into the building. Um, and lastly, for our in-person plan, um, again, we are uh, working to be really thoughtful about how we dismiss students um, to limit hallway traffic. Um, so we are uh, uh, going to work with um, the high school to um, dismiss in waves so that um, we don't have huge groups of students um, sort of exiting the building all at once. Um, we're still working on the exact logistics of that and it's um, generally dependent on what sort of plan we're in. Um, um, so we'll have more information on that forthcoming. Um, and we do expect that, that students will depart the building um, at the end of the day, um, the exception to that. Um, and we're sort of, we're, we're awaiting more guidance on this, but if we feel like we can run um, co-curriculars and athletics safely based on the guidelines we get, um, then students would be able to participate in those things. Again, we haven't gotten that guidance at this point. Um, and so we are waiting that to make those plans. Um, at the middle school, our hybrid plan, uh, much like with Alden and Chandler, I'll just reiterate all, all the safety precautions that um, I, I just spoke about uh, for the building would be in place for those student groups in person in our hybrid plan. Um, so uh, again, we, we will have students at each grade level broken into two groups, um, our A cohort and our B cohort. Um, and those students will be assigned two days of in-person learning and two days of remote learning. Um, again, with Monday, Thursday being one group and Tuesday, Friday being another. Um, and Wednesday would be a virtual learning day without scheduled class times, um, but where students will work independently and can connect with teachers as needed. 
um, and we have that uh, day designated for teacher planning um, and a variety of, of um, other uh, important meetings um, to support our students, whether it be co-planning with special educators, um, student assistance, team meetings, um, and things like that. Um, so to start our school day in the, in the hybrid plan, again, um, we would follow that bell schedule I reviewed um, when I uh, started um, talking about our plans. Um, and students, all students, regardless of if they were at home, in the at-home cohort for the day or the in-person cohort for the day, um, would be starting um, and attend uh, class at 820. Um, students will follow the bell schedule and the rotation uh, not rotation in this case, but the movement between periods um, and attendance would be taken each period. Um, and so what you can see here, we do offer some of our electives uh, in an A or B schedule. Specifically, those are um, uh, world language and music classes most often and sometimes our PE classes. Um, so uh, I did want to show you that uh, grouping of, of classes. So we have uh, two, day, two A days in a row and two B days in a row to allow for students um, in both cohorts each week to get um, an in-person and a remote version of that class. So throughout the day, if you are um, uh, the remote group, if you're the, the group at home for that day, um, you'll participate in um, synchronous classroom experiences remotely during each class period. So um, that will look like at least 15 minutes um, of each class period in the, in the bell schedule will be with your peers um, and your teacher that's at school. Um, the teachers will uh, work to support those, those kids at home by suggesting completion times for activities. Um, the, the remote work um, may often uh, be designed to allow students to work independently with support as needed um, and as appropriate students may also be supported and taught by a variety of other educators like special ed, um, speech and language, um, IAs will be there to support. Um, and whenever the, the X block meets, when the kids in school are having lunch um, for part of that period, um, the teachers will monitor that group in front of them and, and um, provide targeted support to those kids virtually as well. So we'll maintain that model. Um, for the students in school, again, we're, we're still following that um, eight period uh, rotation. Um, as I said, the building procedure safety plans are consistent with our full return. Um, and students will continue to remain in cohorts by team whenever possible. Um, we uh, expand our um, uh, spacing in classrooms, uh, aiming for six feet um, as much as possible, but no less than three um, in classrooms. And some of our spaces are equipped with uh, some plexiglass partitions um, that help us with that. Um, teachers, again, and students will still wipe down desks between cohort groups. Um, our lunch spaces continue to be spread throughout the building. Um, even though we would be um, at a 50% capacity, we'd want to continue to spread our groups out and use all those spaces. Um, and lunch would still be coming to those team areas um, before students headed to their space for lunch. Um, and we do think in this model, teachers uh, will need to maximize that instructional time with students while they're in person um, with some of the, the specific activities that maybe don't lend themselves to that remote environment. Um, and uh, in this model, particularly with the every other day, um, the opportunity for teachers to really prepare kids for their day not in um, their day remotely, um, uh, we think um, improves uh, the, the kids' access that's at home. And then again, ending the day, um, uh, again, we'll follow that waived dismissal process um, to ensure we don't, even with 50% capacity across both buildings, we don't have um, any crowds uh, as much as possible over controlling that exit. Um, and I just included the schedule again um, for you to get another look at it. Um, this next slide, uh, Mr. Donovan is going to talk about, uh, it talks about our, our cohort C um, and how we're uh, addressing it um, at the middle and high school. Good evening, everyone. Uh, 
thank you so much for being here and uh, for taking some time to, to, uh, to see these plans. So uh, cohort C at the middle school and the high school is going to be uh, a different model than at the elementary schools. Um, so what we are uh, going to, to do is to create a, uh, an experience for our students who choose to be in virtual from the first day of school, uh, a remote, excuse me, from the first day of school, and, uh, and build a Duxbury middle school or high school uh, experience for those students. Um, it's gonna be linked to the standards aligned with our classroom experiences uh, for students who are participating in a hybrid model or in an in-person model, uh, but it will be different. Um, we do expect that for both buildings, we will have some limits on uh, the number of course offerings. And so what we're really gonna do is focus on the major core requirements uh, and as we get to high school graduation requirements um, for students. And uh, I, I fully expect that there are gonna be classes uh, and I, you know, I was formerly the course teacher, so a student, if they choose to be in course, cohort C, uh, choosing course uh, is the type of course that would uh, most likely not be available to them. Um, it will be both a synchronous and asynchronous experience. Uh, there will be weekly Zoom meetings uh, with teachers, um, similar educational outcomes and assessments for all students. Uh, we, we do expect that it's possible uh, that there's some third party uh, platforms uh, for uh, scenarios like uh, world language uh, or for very specific courses that um, that students may wish to uh, pursue if it's a, if it's an option um, but I think the big thing uh, is the what the exact environment will look like will depend a little bit on how many students choose to um, select cohort C uh, and so th the model will evolve a little bit in the coming weeks uh, a really big difference is, uh, or something to consider, is if at some point during the year, uh, the uh, school district moves from either in-person to a remote scenario or from a hybrid to a remote scenario, uh, students at both the middle school and the high school who elected to be in cohort C from the outset uh, would remain in that cohort uh, until at least the midway point of the school year. Um, so I'm just going to finish up here with uh, um, the middle school's remote plan. Um, just uh, briefly, uh, students continue with the four-day schedule um, I described in the hybrid plan with, again, uh, Wednesday being a virtual learning day, um, but with all students at home. We would retain the same schedule, um, the uh, uh, one through um, seven with the X block around lunch. Um, again, students would be expected to attend uh, their remote learning sessions. Um, we'd start at 820 with the first block class. Um, and what you'll notice is that uh, a lot of this language is what the hybrid experience is for the kids at home. Um, it, this would be for um, now all students if we were in a remote um, environment entirely. Um, so Zoom in instruction to uh, occur at least 15 minutes um, of each class. Um, and that kids are expected to engage with that, um, that teachers would support that work, um, providing uh, asynchronous materials, prioritizing small group support during the class period for students. Um, and again, as appropriate, we'd continue those um, services and supports um, by various educators uh, for the students that need them. Um, and then when block eight meets, um, teachers uh, would provide targeted support to um, uh, small groups virtually. So it's a, an additional sort of chunk of time that um, teachers can access students and students can access teachers um, in this remote environment. Oops. Um, one thing I did before I uh, handed over to um, Jim for the high school, um, uh, we do anticipate um, needing to hand out our uh, uh, Chromebooks to all incoming sixth graders. Um, typically, uh, in years past, we've had them uh, use Chromebooks during the school day um, or use their laptops during the school day out of carts, pick them up in the morning and then drop them off in the afternoon. Um, but we do think, um, given the 
uh, possibility of us being in any of these three scenarios sort of at any point in the year, we need to be postured to be ready for that. And so um, we want to equip uh, our incoming sixth graders with that technology um, and are working on plans in, in any of these environments to ensure uh, our sixth graders are well on ramped to those devices um, and have the skills to manage those devices as effectively as possible um, throughout the year. And I can take any questions about the middle school plans or if you want to hear the high school ones because we kind of have some shared spaces um, either way. I have a question, but I think it'll be for both middle school, high school. Um, I haven't seen any mention of homework. Is the assumption that the work that's assigned when they're in person is what they're working on when they're remote, sort of that, you know, if you're in on Monday, you do that work Tuesday? Because if they're online in the classroom for seven hours, are they going to have homework on top of that that they have to do on the computer, I guess is the question. I think the short answer is um, all of our practices are going to evolve uh, when, when we're in that environment. And so, um, at, you know, at, at the middle school and the high school, we were planning to evolve anyway under the previous schedule model. And we would have made uh, adjustments to what that workload would have been for all of our kids. And I think something similar is, gonna, is going to happen. Uh, and that's something that, um, you know, Mrs. McGuire and I were speaking about today, earlier today. Um, you know, the, 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 the reality of that schedule is it allows every kid to have contact with their teacher every day. Um, and that was something that we did not have last year. Uh, and that was a, um, for all of our stakeholders, something that's everybody wanted. And so uh, that's something we're going to be able to achieve with the schedule change. And there are other things that we are absolutely going to have to adjust. Um, and homework is something we're already talking about. Okay, thanks. This is Shannon. I have a very, very small question. Um, has there been any discussion about the, you guys mentioned the lunch orders. Could those go electronics and what's the notes that Chase mentioned? Have you guys had any conversations around that? Yeah, we're, um, uh, I'll, I'll share. We're exploring what the best mode is for um, our, our uh, chart wells to get those orders, but we were um, uh, imagining that would be entirely uh, online and whether it's a Google form they're filling out first thing in the morning or some sort of menu that um, chart wells can post and families can do at home. We haven't quite worked out the details of that, but yes, the goal would be that that would be electronic um, and not um, an opportunity to pass pieces of paper across large <laughs> numbers of people. I, I thought so. Thank you. Right. All right, I guess we'll then uh, move it on. Um, uh, some of the high school, so very similar to uh, what uh, Mr. Chosier said earlier, uh, you know, there's a lot of overlap between the, pr the plans for the middle school and the high school. So uh, I'll just try to briefly touch on those and highlight the, uh, the differences. So uh, like Ms. McGuire said, we're depending upon, uh, you know, in our in-person, um, everyone's fully in-person, uh, we, we will definitely be dealing with issues of staggered starts. Uh, and kind of a rolling start to the day and a rolling end of the day. Um, like the middle school, parent drop-off will, will remain along the back of the middle school uh, and along the side, uh, and bus, the bus drop-off area will still be in the front uh, of the high school. Um, I think b the biggest change for, behavior, uh, for the behavior of students when they come in the building is that we're gonna ask that they go right to class from the moment they arrive. Um, if you've been in the building, um, before you've seen, you know, kids spending a lot of time socializing in the hallway and and getting some laps in uh, that that's a practice that we're not going to be able to continue in this environment uh, for for obvious reasons. Uh, we will have a lunch ordering system, although the at the moment um, we are looking at ways that we can still have some a la carte um, options for students. Um, and we're going to ask that no that uh, really nowhere in the building do students congregate. Um, unless they're outside of the building. So uh, we do have a, a rather large front uh, patio area uh, between the bus drop off and the seats and in the front doors. 
We also have some grass areas uh, on the other side of the parking lot. And I, I suspect that students will remain outside of the building uh, longer in the morning and then move in. Uh, and like the middle school hallway lockers, which are uh, admittedly not used often by high school students, uh, will not be available next year. Um, moving on. Uh, so lunch, um, you know, we're going to have two lunches uh, for the uh, for the entire building next year. Um, that is, uh, you know, a significant change from what we're used to. Um, but what I need everyone to kind of imagine is we're also in, uh, almost doubling the amount of places where students can have lunch. So that's going to allow us to maintain the six foot minimum uh, during lunch periods by using the classrooms, the exterior of the building, the courtyard of the building. We have the outside patio area. There'll be some seating in the cafeteria uh, and uh, in and along our long hallways uh, inside the building. So we feel confident that we can do that. Uh, we also are making lunch longer uh, to accommodate um, what we expect will be different travel patterns and uh, you know, a different, uh, for pre people who are purchasing or picking up their ordered food, a different process there. Um, the uh, library, which has always been accessible to students during the lunch period, instead of going to the cafeteria, uh, this year will not be accessible to students. Um, but we are opening up additional areas around the building where students who previously went to the library will have opportunities uh, to go. And um, with the exception of before and after school, what we're really uh, looking for to, when students arrive in the morning and when students uh, leave dismissal, we're really going to mark doors as the entrance doors and the exit doors um, so that we have uh, for better cleaning protocols. Thank you. Uh, so there is, as uh, you know, people have referenced earlier, there was some new guidance about music art and PE courses, uh, which came out last Friday that has certainly changed some of our plans. Uh, for these areas and so exactly what those classroom experiences will look like are going to evolve greatly uh, over the coming weeks um, but I, I would say the big takeaway is that these courses are, are going to be there for kids and they're important uh, to our school and to our students and so we're going to find a way to create the opportunities the best opportunity that we can create uh, that includes um, certainly physical education for which we'll follow all the guidance uh, we will be closing the locker rooms uh, until it is uh, safe to use them again uh, we likely will have some form of individual supply kits for art students by classes. Um, the, um, uh, the library again will have, uh, we are limiting the circulation of books. Uh, guidance will be almost entirely by appointment only. Uh, and then um, emergencies, we're gonna uh, have uh, those kind of funnel through the main offices, um, which is not much of a disruption. It's a, a, a change of uh, kind of workflow, but it's not significant at all. Um, so when we're in person, uh, we are going to have waves of dismissal. And so whether we're in person or it's the hybrid plan, we're going to try to uh, minimize the amount of traffic that we can uh, form on Main Street and use different doors and try to funnel people out of the building faster uh, and more directly. Um, we also, uh, as, in particular at the high school, we, we have often had students who have hung around for quite some time after school's ended. Uh, waiting for different activities. And we're really going to try to uh, make a concerted effort to have students, if they're not here for extra help or to participate in a co-curricular athletic event, um, that they move, uh, move on from the, from the building as close to 3 p.m. as possible. That being said, as uh, Dr. Antonucci said earlier, athletics, um, there, there is some positive motion there uh, about, about many of our sports returning in the fall. And I would say that there are opportunities for our co-curricular groups uh, also to meet, provided that uh, they maintain, they're able to maintain the DESE guidance and maintain all the social distancing requirements. And in particular, because we do have some very large co-curricular groups that they don't exceed the capacity of the spaces that they're meeting in. Uh, and so we're going to take all of our co-curriculars on a case-by-case uh, -case basis in the fall. And, and the co-curricular programs are very important to our high school students and to our teachers and to our community. And so we're going to, uh, we're going to do everything we can to to get everything we can up and running within the parameters of the guidance. Uh, so like the middle school, we're gonna have an A and B group for hybrids, or excuse me, like the districts. Again, we really, um, just to highlight this, uh, we, we're really making an effort to make sure that families are, are aligned in the groups A's and B's vertically throughout the district. Uh, and that's a bit of a, 
priority for, for all of us from the outset and something that we are working hard to make sure that we, uh, that we achieve. Um, students, uh, you know, the cohorts are Monday, Thursday for in-person and Tuesday, Friday. Uh, unlike, or I should say, a, a di an important difference between the schools um, is that we are really looking for synchronous experiences on every day, even in a virtual environment, whether that is uh, checking in uh, and taking attendance, uh, those things are going to happen every day uh, that the classes meet. I'll say uh, one other thing too is that whether it, we're in the in-person, in the remote, uh, or in a hybrid plan, uh, we will be using our standard grading practices. Uh, this is a big change from last fall, from last spring, excuse me, we went to a modified pass or fail system. That is something that we are not considering at all. And we're going to be turning to kind of grades it's, and grading as everyone knew it. Uh, when we're in our hybrid plan, uh, we expect all students to be at class, uh, all seven class periods, um, or excuse me, eight class periods uh, every day. Um, if they're in a, a uh, remote learning, that they are, there'll be some synchronous experiences. Again, it could be a check-in for anywhere between five to 20 minutes, uh, or full class experiences if there's a collaborative work where kids are, are collaborating uh, through a uh, you know, any of our Google platforms or Meet or through Zooms. Um, what we want to make sure is that the, uh, that when students are working remotely, that they're being asked uh, to do tasks that they can achieve in the time that they're doing it. And we're going to spend a lot of time planning uh, in uh, late August and early September to make sure that our design al allows for that. We also, when students are in remote days, we also are, are we'll be working hard to make sure that all of our students have access to all the special education services and related service providers uh, that they need to. Uh, for in-person learning, again, students are there every day. All the procedures, the safety procedures that we have been talking about throughout tonight's presentation are in play for all students. Um, and we'll be able to get to six feet in most of our classes. I will say this one thing about the cohort. We're building cohorts at the high school to be 50% of each grade, grade level. Um, and so, what that will mean is that generally, if we're in a hybrid uh, scenario, all of our classes will, or I should say none of our classes will be at their full capacity. Um, but the capacity is likely to fluctuate uh, on either side of 50%, um, just based on the, uh, the variables associated with having seven schedules. Um, and uh, we're really making a focus on, for our teachers, when we have in-person days to focus on the experience uh, maximizing their time with students. Um, and again, in every scenario, uh, every kid is meeting eight periods a day, and that directed study hall period will meet every day. Uh, and the intervention period, which uh, Ms. McGuire uh, mentioned earlier, that was a, a big part of our, our previously proposed schedule change, will exist in this environment as well. In a modified format, but it will exist. Uh, and finally, in our remote learning environments, um, what we are going to expect this year is that all, uh, should we find ourselves in this scenario at any time, that all of our kids will meet uh, their class periods as assigned and will follow the uh, order of bells and everyone will meet in every class, attendance will be taken, the grading policies will remain the same, um, and it will be more like school uh, when we're in person than the model that we uh, had to adopt last spring. Um, there'll be synchronous classroom experiences during each period. Um, there'll be a minimum of 15 minutes of Zoom uh, in a full remote environment. Um, we'll make sure that we have, uh, that we plan for completion times and due dates so that uh, stuff is not all due on Friday. It'll be due throughout the week. Um, the, again, the idea is that st students will be working independently in this environment, but support will be provided and it'll be provided uh, during the class periods in which that class is assigned to me. Um, and again, w w all of our special education and related service providers will be available should we be in a, rem in a remote environment anytime this year. And also, uh, like the middle school, the direct study hall periods will occur. We're supervising teachers, but they will occur differently. We'll have some one-on-one uh, -on -one support um, and conferencing with students, and also some check-ins uh, for different scenarios. Uh, I'd also say that in all three of these plans, or excuse me, in the, in the hybrid and remote learning plan, uh, 
our guidance services will be available to kids all the time, right? So our guidance counselors will be available in, to parents and to students to make appointments. Uh, most everything will be occur um, from a parent perspective over Zoom um, and through video conferencing and students will be able to meet with counselors during the day. They'll have to sign up and go through the similar process to what we have always done. And I'd be happy to take any questions from anyone. Yeah, um, Jim, I, a question, and you, you said it um, quickly, but I'd like to come back to it. Um, this is in regards to um, cohort C, and it sort of probably applies with all of the, all of the um, schools and grades. Um, what if a parent or a student collectively decide to migrate from cohort C to A or B. And conversely, if a student is tested positive in cohort A or B, do they go into cohort C for 14 days because they may not be sick and they're going to want to continue to learn? So is cohort C thought of as a flex in and out because uh, when you said you couldn't come back to A or B at least through half of the year, I don't know how we deal with a student who is positive for the virus. Where does that student go? Um, and it would seem cohort C could be the flex. We could allow our parents flexibility to move from C back into A or B and vice versa if, if a student is um, uh, needs to be out of school, they may still be able to continue to pa participate fully in school, but not in person. So anyhow, that was just my question. I'm a little uh, confused about what do we do with a student who is, um, you know, still needs to go to school, but can't be in school for 14 days or whatever the guidance is. Um, and vice versa, what if a family member, you know, really strongly feels and a student collectively that they want to do the hybrid or in person based on the experience in the community? Uh, yeah, so that's a great question, and I was not clear about it um, in how I articulated it earlier. So I'll, let me try again. So cohort C, um, you need to think of it almost as like a, a program within the school, right? So students who choose to be in the cohort C from before, from uh, from the outset, will uh, at the middle school and high school start um, in that virtual environment and remain there throughout. Uh, if a student chooses to be in or elects to be in the hybrid model and they're in cohort A or B. Uh, if a student is, uh, you know, ends up in the scenario you described, right, or having to quarantine for 14 days, then they would, they would be able to exist, um, they would be able to access their classes in, by just attending both halves of the virtual environment or the hybrid environment for that class. Okay. And I would say that that's similar to, um, you know, a student who, um, you know, develops mono and is out for 10 days. Uh, we would do our best to keep them synced up. And then and, and, and if we are in a hybrid model, that will actually be much easier to do. Um, what we expect is, and the, and the reason that difference is there is we do expect that students who are in cohort C will have a very different experience from the beginning um, in some, in some uh, important areas. And um, so the opportunity for those kids to flex in and out um, at this point in our planning, we, we don't see that as a, as a viable option. Um, and uh, so students who are in the A and B cohort, should they find themselves in that position, would, would be able to continue with the classes and with the teachers that they have. Um, what we don't want to do is to have kids flexing back and forth if they've had a different you know, experience for a couple of weeks and lining back up. It's just very difficult. So um, really, we want, we want to make the changes right at the beginning of the year and then midway through the year. Okay, so, you know, just um, the, that uh, you, you know, like teacher assignments is a, a subject of uh, a lot of uh, discussion early in semesters. You might imagine how uh, making a choice that basically locks a student and a family member into a path for the school year. It, it's just, I think that's gonna take quite a bit of um, communication, education, discussion. Um, and just make clear that it's not a, uh, there's, it's a pretty important commitment that parents and uh, their students will have to make uh, more or less at the beginning of the school year. Um, so anyhow, I think that's fine because you'll get a lot of requests 
based on how things play out um, to have people switching back and forth. So um, you just have to, you probably have to um, just, you know, you've thought it through, but you'll have to deal with the consequences. <laughs> yeah, <I know. laughs> so I'm just saying that's going to take some uh, uh, strong communication. The community has to understand, right? Um, you, you can't just start then saying, oh, okay, yeah, you're making a good case. You can now switch. You know, it's going to be very difficult. Um, does that make sense? Yeah, and I think a really important thing is we want to keep, when, if a student chooses to be in cohort two, we want to build a community there as best we can. And, and the same is true for our, our classroom experiences. And um, fluctuating between those two environments doesn't, uh, it just, it's not as easy to do. So then just to expand on that, because I, I guess I would say, unless it's a very special circumstance, the, the cohort C would also then be precluded from participation in extracurricular clubs and or sports, or what's the thinking on that? Um, I think the honest answer is we haven't thought about that yet. Okay, so um, yeah, there'll be a lot of questions, I'm sure, on that point, but uh, you know, hopefully most families will get comfortable with um, you know, the uh, full in-person, full, uh, you know, hybrid or fully remote, um, and we'll have a relatively limited number of cohort Cs because it sounds like it could be quite a different experience for those students and those families. Thanks, Peter. Jim, do you have a couple more slides, I think? Um, well, we have ones that are kind of like what the classroom environment would look like. So yes, we do have a couple, but you any other high school specific questions? I have one about guidance, Jim, and it's yeah. something you might not be able to answer tonight, but obviously with rising seniors who are going to be stressed out about applying to college, is it going to be like maybe a resource site they can go to or, um, you know, something that a, a lot of it is online because they access it through. Um, Naviance. Thank you. So, but I just think, you know, you there, there will be obviously as with every single year, lots of extra questions from parents, especially with this stressful time. Yeah. Just food for thought. Yeah. I, yeah, I appreciate that. Yeah. We, um, I think that the, the, there's going to be a, a lot of fluidity, um, over the next couple of months with that college process, um, and with, uh, testing sites and, and everything that that involves. And so, um, I, I, I appreciate that. Maybe we will build something different than, and communicate differently than we have. Um, Sarah, uh, we, we have two slides here that we just want to give you a sense of what the middle school and high school classrooms are likely to look like. So uh, these are science classrooms. Um, in our building, we have about 20 of these rooms. Uh, they're all pretty much exactly the same in square footage and layout. Um, and so this is what a, a science classroom would look like. Um, you can see that the lab tables are spread apart and the bottom uh, two pictures on the screen what you'll see is a you might be able to see is a plexiglass divider. Uh, we've purchased um, literally hundreds of these uh, for all of our for many of our table surfaces um, and it shows you two different ways in which students will be able to sit and, and maintain socially distance maintain the guidance from uh, DESI about being socially distant in classrooms um, and uh, the next slide is um, oh no, um, is what a regular classroom looks like. Um, there we go. And so you can kind of get a visual for what um, a classroom looks like with uh, three feet between every desk. Uh, um, in a hybrid environment, excuse me here for the, my lighting. Um, in a hybrid environment where we have less students per classroom, uh, we obviously would not be using every seat in the classroom. Um, and so there would be a space between there, but that could, gives you a sense of what it could look like um, and uh, under the guidance. Well, I just wanted to thank you all for the great deal of time and effort and thought and consideration that have gone into developing the plans. They seem, I mean, there are obviously areas where you're still working and there'll be questions coming up, but it's a pretty thorough introduction to 
um, what school might look like under the three models, and I appreciate all the work that's gone into it. Kelly, can I say a couple of things? Oh, yeah. Uh, just a few things to wrap up. First, principal's awesome job. Um, um, and I appreciate you saying that, Julia, the, the level of work that went into this is almost hard to, hard to fathom. But I do want to say a couple of things. I know the, a few questions that are being asked uh, in the chat, and Danielle has been manning the chat. Um, thank you, Danielle. But consistent question, and it's a fair question, is why did we pick the AB model versus AA and then BB, right? So go to school Monday and Tuesday cohort A, and then Thursday and Friday, cohort B. And very simply, um, we're very concerned. One of our top priorities is keeping kids connected to, the, to, the, to their teachers and to their peers um, and keeping them engaged. And we're really worried that, for example, if a student comes to school on Monday and Tuesday, they're then gone for five days. And we're really worried that there's going to be a population of students that that's very difficult for. Um, and so that's, that's it. I mean, it's not, not a, um, I'm not suggesting it's the right or wrong model, but based on our priorities about student engagement and student connectedness, um, we felt that, that, that this model that we presented um, kind of allowed us to accomplish that in, in the best way possible. It's still not perfect, but I, I just want to make that point. Um, I also want to make the point, and I, and I, I think it's critical to say this, is that um, these are still draft plans. Uh, it's a living, breathing document. Um, and I'd be remiss if I didn't say that, um, you know, we are actually obligated to uh, what they call impact bargain um, our back to school plans with our Duxbury Teachers Association. And as you know, we have an excellent working relationship with the, with the DTA, but we're all obligated to go to the bargaining table um, and create a memorandum of agreement about our back to school plans. So I, I say that simply because until the teachers union ratifies the memorandum of agreement um, that these plans aren't finalized. Um, and I just think it's, I think it's important to state that, that um, you know, we, we collaborate quite a bit, um, but, but at the end of the day, uh, it needs to be ratified by the teachers union. So I just wanted to make that point um, out of respect for, for their work and their process. That's it for now. Okay, thanks, John. So- oh, I take that back. Can I say one more thing? No, no. <laughs> All right. um, so I, I'm sure people are wondering, um, and, and I guess I think it's important to tip our hand. Um, if we had to make a definitive recommendation tonight, um, we are certainly most definitely leaning towards uh, recommending the hybrid model. Uh, I, ironically, we feel that it provides the most kind of normal school experience for the students. I know it's kind of weird to say that, um, but the, the logistical challenges um, that an in-person return presents, it's almost hard to comprehend. You know, everything from the social distancing guidelines to uh, school bus transportation, double runs, um, all those types of things. Um, and not to mention, and I think it's critical to say this, um, there's a lot of focus in the, in the community and around the state on student safety and student health, and that's fair, but we have to put our teachers and our staff safety up right in line with that. And when we're asking teachers, for example, at the secondary level um, to teach in a full in-person return with a caseload of 130 students um, and doing co-curricular uh, and doing uh, special, you know, our specialist teachers might see 600 students in a week. Um, the in-person return as we'd have to implement it we just think is really difficult. It's not to say it's impossible, um, but I'd, lie, I'd be lying if I told you that I, I thought it was anything uh, less than ideal. So we would recommend a hybrid model um, if, if I had to make a recommendation tonight, but I don't have to make a recommendation tonight. 
um, and so it's subject to change. But I just I think it's important to say that uh, for everybody's sake. All right, great. All right, Kelly, yeah. Okay. So we are up to open comment section, and I would just ask that folks try to keep their comments as brief as possible, two minutes or under, and um, just maintain a level of respect. So John, do you want, oh, um, and can you please raise your hand if you would like to ask a question? And um, I'll have John manage that. You're muted, John. I am, okay, sorry about that. Um, okay, the first one up, I don't know how to pronounce the name, it's Kate, um, Kate Mel, 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 Melka. Uh, Kate, can you hear us? Hi, Kate. It might help to notify each person that they, they come on as muted and so they have to unmute themselves. Kate, can you hear us and uh, unmute, please? Okay, I'm gonna put her, I'm gonna put her back out. I'm sorry, we'll get her back if she wants. Um, next up is Caitlin Gable. Caitlin, can you uh, please unmute yourself? Caitlin? All right, we're striking out here. Okay, I don't have any other hands raised. We can, uh, um, uh, no, I don't see, okay. Um, Hand raised, the first name only, uh, Chris, Christina. Hi, it's Christina, yes. Yes, we can hear you. Great, I, oh, stop it, Sophie. <laughs> Thank you for uh, the information from the teachers, I appreciate it. Um, I have a, a few questions, maybe you've already mentioned it. I think I heard something about grades. So my first question is, um, will the grading criteria remain the same? Um, for all assignments and tests, et cetera. And my second question is, do we have, um, do you have all the appropriate technology and budget at the school for the remote learning um, for the students? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we feel very confident about our technology. Um, you know, it's still, st st still in process and we have some, you know, things to kind of figure out and, and, and um, technology to order, but we, we feel like we're in pretty good shape and we're very fortunate to be in a community uh, where, we are, where we are in good shape. Um, as it relates to the grades, I'll let principals answer this, but I believe it would we'd be grading just like we would be in a normal school scenario. Is that accurate? Yes, okay. So yes, the grading kind of protocols uh, would, would remain uh, as if uh, would be the same as if we were in in, uh, in, a, in a regular school scenario. So thank you for the question. Uh, next is um, um, uh, Ro Rocio Hurtado. Sorry if I mispronounced your name. Oh, not a problem. It's Rocio. Uh, I'm I'm very impressed, and I really thank each and every one of you for the efforts. I'm speaking as a parent, but also as an infectious disease physician. Um, and I have two questions. One is, have there been any discussions about being specific with regards to the types of masks that will be recommended for children in particular because there are many masks that are being sold um, with one-way valves and that would unfortunately partially negate some of the impact we would like for, for masks to have. And the second question is whether there are any thoughts, and I know this may not be possible, but just wanted to at least start the discussion, any thoughts to um, offer influenza vaccination since there will be clearly overlapping syndromes and given all the, the delays in testing when patients or children uh, come down with their respiratory illnesses and fevers, et cetera, especially as we're anticipating the potential overlap of both epidemics, 
Um, I was just wondering if there had been any discussion in that regard. Thank you. Thank you. Um, let me take this in reverse order. As regards, we have not we have not discussed, um, you know, the the uh, the flu vaccine or at least administering it in the school. That being said, that's not something I'd considered, and I think it's important for us. Um, I can I can talk to our um, public health agent in town to see if there's some level of uh, coordination we can do with them to make it easier for families to get the flu vaccine. Um, if you have any further thoughts on that, feel, you know, please feel free to reach out, but I appreciate you asking that question and we'll definitely follow up on that. Uh, as it relates to the masks, um, um, you mentioned the valve, uh, the masks that had the valves in it, those will not be permitted. Um, I actually reached out to a medical professional in the community um, this week asking about that. Uh, and when we release our final plan, it'll be very clear that those masks with the valves will not be uh, permitted. So thank you for that question. And I appreciate you tipping us off on that um, as well. John, could you just briefly, um, we're getting a lot of, I'm having a hard time keeping up with the chat, but a lot of people are wondering when the cohorts will be announced and when the final decision will be made by school committee on um, which plan we're recommending. So principals, I'll have to put it to you, I guess, to say, when do you think the cohorts will be ready to go? And if we have to answer later, we can. <laughs> yeah, Matt, I think the, um, right now we're uh, almost through, almost, we have almost all of Chandler and Alden aligned, and then it will come through the middle school and the high school. So I, I would expect that we're probably making our final tweaks to that list by the end of next week, by the middle to the end of next week, and then we'll release it shortly thereafter. Okay, thank you. There's no other hands up. Um, just so people know, there was a lot of questions in the chat and, and Danielle has been fielding them um, the whole time. And, you know, we'll save that chat too, just so we have a record of those questions. Um, There's one question that I'd like to answer live. Um, it's the difference between the students remote days and Wednesday. I think it's a great question. Um, so on the remote learning days, the students will have the opportunity to either participate in that if you're at the secondary level in that um, attendance opportunity to ask your teacher a question, clarify anything. Um, on the Wednesdays, the teachers will be engaged with um, preparing their consistent learning plans, having meetings, just um, basically there's gonna take a lot of coordination from our staff. And we're gonna have teachers that are potentially um, monitoring a group, B group, and we're still responsible for having special education team meetings and making sure that our special education staff is collaborating with our general education staff. So Wednesdays may look a little different in that they may be truly a remote learning day where the teachers may have a limited um, hour that's designated or a time period where the, if there's questions that they need to ask, but it will look a little bit different in that they potentially wouldn't necessarily need to be working off their bell schedule if they're secondary, although many parents like um, us to be able to provide some structure to the student's day. So certainly parents are welcome to keep their kids on that strict school schedule on Wednesday be, um, because we want kids to really be in learning, learning mode Monday through Friday and not have extended days off. We wanna make sure of that. So Wednesdays could potentially look a little bit more independent than the children's remote learning days where they will be a, have opportunities to log in live with their teacher, if that makes sense. Danielle, um, can I, can I, I'm sorry to put you on the spot, um, yeah. but I'm going to. And uh, <laughs> can you just answer that question uh, that's in, in the chat about, um, you know, in, in a hybrid model in particular, uh, are we, are we going to be able to cover the course content? Like, yeah, it's a great question. A good question. Um, I, I did try to answer it a couple of times, but um, we had a question that was about how can you ex expect to get through a, a full course content that we hardly have enough time to get through um, under the best circumstances when students were with, are with us every day? And the answer is, we said it last week, we know there's no substitution for full in-person learning the way we used to have the luxury of having it before we realized that we could be heading down the road we're in right now. So we're certainly going to um, continue to work with identifying power standards and really making sure that we get the most essential course content so that we're covering everything that we need to cover during a year and allowing students the opportunity to not just hear the instruction, but really kind of master the instruction and be able to show their learning and synthesize their learning across, across different um, content areas. But 
I think that um, we, we're going to do the best we can with it, knowing that it's not perfect. And so I think that we, are go we can commit to saying that students will be ready for the next sequence in the course um, sequences if it, we're looking at math or we're looking at ELA. So with that, it, it's not perfect, but we're, that, that's the work that we're doing on Wednesdays and we're doing all summer to try to make sure that our curriculum maps reflect the fact that we have to be ready for everything this year and we have a lot of content to cover in very limited time. Our transitions are gonna take a little bit longer. We're gonna have less time and we know it's not ideal when students are at home doing some of their learning and discovering on their own on whether it's a remote learning day or whether we need to move to a full remote due to the, um, the cases across the state. So it's a, it's a valid concern and one that we're gonna be working with the teachers with all year. And it's also why we suggested that the students not take the summer off of learning. This wasn't that year where we have six weeks for students to get right back into it. So our hope is that students have remained active with reading, with their math, and, and really looked at those content area resources that were shared back in June so students could stay in practice. So I hope that answers that question. Danielle, I'm going to answer a couple more. Just okay, yeah. That are, we're not going to be able to get to all of them, but I think there's a couple that are worth um, mentioning. Uh, someone asked um, about cohort C. Um, I'm, a little, I'm a little confused, by. It. I think the question is, um, can, a, can a parent sort of choose cohort C? And to be clear, cohort C uh, is in fact that. Uh, cohort C is because a family has told us that they are choosing to keep their student home no matter what the model, right? So whether it's in person, fully in person or hybrid. So cohort C in fact is the parent's choice. We wouldn't be assigning anybody um, to cohort C. We will be assigning people to cohort A and B, right? The alternating days. But I just, that's a really interesting question. I, I, I wanted to kind of clear that up. Um, There's a couple more questions. Sarah, could you speak to the web question that just came in? Yeah, I would love to. Um, so our web program is an orientation we run for any of our new students to the middle school and all of our incoming sixth graders. Um, right now with our um, web leaders, um, Mrs. Oaks and Mr. Corbin, we're exploring um, how that can happen. And it is dependent on how we plan to begin the year. Um, but we do have, um, we will hold some sort of specific orientation for kids coming in. There may be virtual elements um, to the extent that we can have kids in. Um, we hope to have some in-person elements, um, but the program will be happening to um, support our kids coming into the building. It just may look very different. A uh, couple more too. I, I should have mentioned um, when, when we're going to ask families to um, select uh, uh, give us a notice about whether or not they want to uh, keep their student home. We'll probably be sending out something, I'd imagine, almost simultaneously with when our final plan is due, which is about August 10th, um, if not soon, but we will be asking uh, students to make that choice. We'll be, have some kind of form or questionnaire that we'll need, um, we'll need from families. So, um, I wish it could be sooner, but I actually think it behooves everybody to wait a little longer um, so they can actually see the final plans um, and see what's happening with the virus before they make a final decision. The other sort of very simple question I'm going to answer here is um, technology question. Do, do we have the bandwidth um, to have everyone kind of online and hosting Zoom calls throughout the day? And the answer is we hope so. Um, we are increasing our bandwidth by uh, 5x. So we're, uh, we, are, we just purchased um, five times the amount of bandwidth um, for the start of the school year. So we, we expect that to be more than sufficient to, uh, to handle the traffic. But thank you for that question. John, does the bandwidth go in hand with um, like Schoology kept crashing in the spring because kids everywhere were on it? Are we anticipating any issues with that? So, I, so I don't, Kelly, I'd have, to, I, I'd have to say I don't know on that. That might be kind of a, um, a Schoology problem that, you know, everybody from around um, the country uh, maybe was, was making the system crash. But I don't know. If principals have a better knowledge of that, sorry, it looks like I'm wrong. So, no, you're not, you're not wrong. Um, that was a Schoology issue. I, I'm a... I'm, 
I'm an ambassador with Schoology, and so I have been sitting on some like meetings about how they're preparing for the year. Um, and they uh, actually have recently been purchased by PowerSchool, which is a, a much larger group. And um, their plan is to have built up their own um, ability to, to manage remote environments um, being used far more frequently, um, given what they anticipate um, this school year looking like for a variety of uh, really across the entire country um, using that platform. So I'm hopeful we don't run into the same kind of crashing issues. They seem um, confident that they won't run into those issues. A couple more questions I'm just going to jump on about um, families that are considering creating their own learning program, like a homeschool program for their students this year. Um, that would still, we haven't received guidance that um, homeschooling would be any different than in typical years. And if you look on our website under um, the family tab, you'll see homeschool information and there's an application process and I would be the person that would approve homeschool programs. So if you are interested in doing that, there's information available and you'd be able to fill out a form that you're intending to homeschool your child for the year. If you do homeschool your child, they do become unenrolled from Duxbury Public Schools. So it's a little bit of a different status than if you're a family that is opting for a virtual or remote learning situation this year. So I'm glad to answer questions about that. You can email me if you're considering homeschooling. Maybe one more very simple and um... It's a really interesting question, great question. What exactly is a mask break, right? Uh, it's what it sounds like. It's giving kids um, an opportunity to take off their masks um, and, and uh, with appropriate social distancing, maybe get outside, maybe spread out um, to a different part of the building. But for anybody who's had a mask on for hours at a time, um, you know it can be exhausting. And so we know that kids and adults are gonna need a break from that throughout the day. It's, it's that simple. It's going to disrupt the school day, um, but I cannot imagine uh, not giving kids and adults, I should add, uh, the opportunity to take off their mask um, periodically throughout the school day. So um, yeah, it's a great question. I'm sorry we weren't clearer about that. Yep, I wanted to just say, we've had a couple of questions in the chat from district staff, and we would never expect the staff to have to answer, ask a question in a school committee chat box. So we have a plan to um, send out information about a town hall meeting to the staff, and we intend to do some town hall meetings um, in a couple of weeks or as soon as possible for families by each school who may have some individual questions that didn't get addressed tonight. And um, there's, there's a number of questions that we can't answer tonight. So I know that there's a few questions about special education. And I think that um, Heather Tucker at a future meeting would be able to speak a little bit more um, in detail about special education services. And um, I don't, we don't want to put her on the spot tonight. Tonight wasn't a night for a SPED presentation, but there are certainly, we understand a number of families that have questions in all of these models, what special education services would look like. And we understand that that's very important. So that will be forthcoming. And we plan to have school committee meetings as often as we need to um, throughout the rest of the summer, as long as there remain questions. There's actually two, two hands raised that I want to get to and then we can wrap up. Um, Actually, uh, Jenna Lee is one of them. Jenna Lee, did you want to say something? Surprise guest from the middle school uh, visit from the middle school assistant principal. Nope, that was an accident. Hey, Jenna Lee. <laughs> <laughs> but hello, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> I'll put you back. Good, good talking to you. Um, and Michelle, Michelle Murphy. Hi, how are you? Sorry to keep you waiting, Michelle. <laughs> no problem. Um, I just had a question that I had sent in um, earlier on the chat, just trying to understand that if you choose cohort C for your child in a hybrid situation, is, has it been discussed or is it an option to either do live streaming of the classroom with the teacher teaching or is it possible maybe for the classroom to be recorded so that a child could log in later and watch the lesson you know, be presented? Yeah. Good question. I'm going to ask uh, Danielle possibly. I think she's answered that. I, I knew you were going to send that my way. I was looking forward to your response. Yes. Um, it simply isn't feasible for us to be live streaming entire classes all the time. We don't teach the, teach that way, and we don't want um, we don't want to have our students visible on the screen and having the class visible and recorded for a number of reasons. So 
the way we've, we've talked about it a lot. The way we teach in school when we have the luxury of being all together is that the teachers give brief bouts of information and present new content. Um, maybe give a little mini lecture, but we, we try to keep our talking to short bursts. And then we, we work with the students in small groups so that they're able to apply what they're learning and ask questions. So it's not feasible for any teacher to be standing in front of a camera for an entire class period, whether you're elementary or secondary, and just be teaching. That's just not how it works in schools. That's why we wanted to, um, we want teachers to have the option to be able to be live if they choose to for a couple of minutes or whatever is appropriate to be able to connect with at home learners, to be able to maybe do a demonstration of a problem on the board, be able to respond to a question that came up um, while a student's working at home. But then we, we aren't recording full classes for students to be able to watch in, in real time. Unfortunately, that's just not something that we can manage. And I don't, I don't know that we'd have the bandwidth to be able to be logged into that extent all day, every day. So the, the shorter answer to that is no, but we're hoping that with the time the teachers have had to look at the curriculum over the summer, when we talk about asynchronous instruction, we're hoping that the teachers are all going to be really good at recording themselves, providing some instruction and putting that video in the, the student's course content so they could watch that video over and over again until they understand the concept or putting Khan Academy videos or assigning the types of things that the students can watch as much as they need to until they have some understanding of the skill. So that's something that we are hoping to really have good solid um, asynchronous as well as an opportunity for, for teachers to be live to be able to answer those questions. So it's a combination. Unfortunately, we, we aren't going to be offering full virtual courses at any level. So just want to make that really clear. Okay. Okay. Thanks, Danielle. Thank you. It looks like that's it for uh, public comment. Yes. I think we're okay. Okay. So we are going to move on for items that we need to vote upon action items. So our first action, action item is a vote to approve the collective bargaining agreement between the Duxbury School Committee and the Duxbury Administrative Assistance Association. Can I have a motion to sure. accept the bargaining? I'm, I move that we um, approve the collective bargaining agreement between Duxbury School Committee and the Duxbury Administrative Assistance Association. Second. Do we have any discussion about this? Okay. All in favor? Julia? Aye. Julia? Matt? Aye. Peter? Aye. <clears throat> Aye. Shannon? Aye. And Kelly, aye. Okay, the next vote is to approve the mask resolutions. There were two of them. The first one was on um, state funding for COVID-19. And the second was on anti-racism. Did everybody have a chance to read those? Kelly, just, just let me um, interrupt for a second, just so the public knows what you're talking about. So um, MASC is the Mass, Associa uh, Mass Association of School Committees. Uh, and they've, they're asking committees to vote on a couple of resolutions related to um, funding and anti-racism. So I just wanted to clarify what that organization was. Sorry great. to interrupt. No, that's great. Um, can I have a motion to approve the mask resolutions? I so moved. Okay, second. Thank you, Julia. Any discussion on these? I think at some point we need to kind of electronically sign them or something like that. But I, um, there, the idea was that school committees would, um, across the state, would sign these resolutions so that um, there would be a kind of collective move to um, pressure the state for support in funding COVID-related responses and as well as working on anti-racism um, responses. 
great. So if it comes our way, I'll let people know if, you know, John and I see it and, and we need to sign it. We'll let you know. Um, okay, so we've had the motion. Can Let's do a vote. Um, Shannon. Hi. Peter. Hi. Matt. Hi. Julia. Hi. Kelly. Hi. Okay, there's nothing else on the agenda. Does anybody have anything that we haven't covered? Anybody on school committee? Well, are we gonna have a meeting next week? That it, we talked about that briefly, I think. Yeah, I think we're gonna have to. Um, I'll talk to Kelly. Um, so let me just, so I think, yes, I think we definitely have to. So let me, let me figure that out. But uh, it probably, well, it won't be on Wednesday though. There's a uh, community event, uh, the anti-racism event, um, and I, it's been long planned, and so I, I think we need to avoid that conflict. Um, so stay tuned, maybe potentially next Thursday, um, August 6th, um, if that's okay. And, I, and I, I might, I'm just trying to think out loud for a second, the 6th is a Thursday, 7th, 8th, 9th. Yeah, because our final plan is due to the state, um, by August 10th. And so we probably, let me think that through, but we might have a final recommendation for you next week um, to vote on. All right, great. Okay. Sounds good. Okay, can I have a motion to adjourn? Move to adjourn. Second. Uh, all in favor, Peter. Aye. Shannon. Aye. Matt. Aye. Julia. Aye. Kelly, aye. Thank you, everybody. That was a lot of work tonight. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. Good night, everybody. Bye. Good night.